I offer these words in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for that indulgence in hearing the larger portion of that gospel. I believe those on the committee who compile our lectionary did a disservice on this day for that gospel, which is even more bizarre because the gospel they're pulling from is Mark which is the shortest gospel that we have. Mark was the first gospel written. And if you read through Mark, particularly if you've been listening for the past few weeks, there is a sense of urgency in Mark. There's a frenetic sense that's unmistakable. In Mark, there's no virgin birth. Jesus just suddenly walks out into the wilderness and says, the kingdom of God is here. Please join me. There's an interesting word that we translate in English that occurs throughout Mark's gospel. It's what we say immediately. It's a Greek word, and we hear it twice here this morning. Immediately Jesus did this, and immediately the disciples went and did this, and immediately the crowd began to sense it. Did you pick up on some of, actually, some of the humor in the reading? The disciples who had been sent out by Jesus to teach, remember that from a couple of weeks ago? that famous part about when you go into a town and village and you talk about God's kingdom, if someone won't listen to you, you shake off the dust of your sandals, that's where we are. So the disciples had been out in farms and villages and the countryside proclaiming God's kingdom, laying hands on people, trying to heal them in the name of Jesus. And so they come they return to meet with Jesus. Perhaps this was their annual performance review. Those of you who've worked in HR may appreciate that a little bit more. So they come back for their review and they tell Jesus all that they had done and taught. And guess what? The people are still there. They won't go away. Jesus says, let's go take a break. Or this is always a good idea in the church. Jesus says, let's go take a retreat. Let's go to Shrine Mite for the weekend and get away from it all. And guess what? They make the two-hour drive to Shrine Mott, and there they are. We still need more help. We need you. They can't get a break to save their life. That's the way it is, it seems, in Mark's gospel. The crowd is everywhere. There is more need. There is more need than one can imagine, and there is more need such that what do I do in the face of this? I have many of those days, like the disciples. I spend a number of hours here with all you church people, and then I drive down the road and I see someone standing at the intersection on the island with a sign asking for food or assistance. And I think, my God, I can't even get away from this. I'm only five minutes from the church. Can't these people go away? Or if you're like me at times, why can't they just go get a job and not be standing here in front of me looking for something? I don't want to give them money because no telling what they might do with it. 
Can I really solve world hunger? Can I solve hunger here in Fairfax? Can I solve hunger here in Burke? Those are the kinds of thoughts and questions that run through my mind. I suspect they have crossed your mind on occasion. All this need in the world that confronts us. And so we come to church in part to find that rest in God, to come and sing music to God, to offer our prayers of joy, to offer our prayers of concern, to offer all of ourselves. We come here for rest and fellowship and connections to go back out into the world as your rector, I am very aware, even sensitive, to the need that in our life with God for rest. In our life with God, call it what you will, life with God, life as a Christian, life as a disciple, fill in the blank for how you Phrase that. There is a need for rest, prayer, contemplation, recharging. There is a need for that. And so as your rector, my duty for the past six years, if some of you, and by the way, some of you have picked up on this, but for others, my job for the past six years and my calling has been to urge you to take more rest. Because we who live in Fairfax County love to fill out a schedule and a calendar. And the temptation, the temptation can be to make life with God, life as a disciple, life as a Christian, the temptation can be to make this one more activity that gets on our calendar for the week. And there are times where I hope your coming here and being here is not just one more thing to check off on your schedule. Because if it is, then I've done something wrong. I need to remind you that life with God is about going away and praying and resting and retreat. And yet, and yet, life with God, life as a disciple, also involves doing something with that belief and that prayer and that life with God. It's both and. And so we live in this tension, don't we? Between trying to find rest in God and prayer and contemplation and then things we need to do for others and for the world. We live in this balance of rest and work. So for centuries, people have been trying to figure out, how do you do this? How do you practically, every day, create a life for yourself that pays attention to rest and work? And so hundreds of years ago, one person in Italy came up with the plan. And he wrote something called a rule of life. Rule, uh, ruler something you measure, something that's a standard. And so Benedict came up with this wonderful plan of a way to organize your life, even your daily life, around God. So all of us in Fairfax County have to love something like this, don't we? Here's something printed you can take and go organize and schedule your life around. You wake in the morning, 
Maybe your first words in the morning should be directed to God. So that's a good time to pray. Before you go to bed, it's probably another good time to pray. And so Benedict comes up with all of these times where you can do that. Benedict comes up with a time to work every day. Because Benedict, like most monks I know, are believers in work. Life with God is not couch contemplation. It involves work for yourself, for the good of yourself, and for the good of others. And then Benedict suggested that you should even have time every day where you rest. So for all of you who may nap on occasion, Benedict says that is just fine. I often say, do you know what the monks would tell you if you fall asleep while you're trying to pray? It means your body needs rest has nothing to do with your spiritual life. Benedict would even suggest that one should have fun every day. Prayer, rest, work, fun, all of this should be part of life with God. Many of you, most of you know that I lived for a number of months in a Benedictine monastery in South Louisiana, and so my life has been forever shaped by Benedict and his rule of life. So there were a lot of times that we prayed, particularly at 5.30 in the morning. Now, I cannot remember many of those prayers at 5.30 in the morning. There were times I worked alongside them, worked with them, and there were times that I played with them. The most memorable, one of the most memorable experiences of living in a Benedictine monastery in South Louisiana, mind you, was one night when I joined the monks over a couple of beers as we watched a college football game between LSU and Notre Dame. (laughs) Doesn't get much better. LSU versus Notre Dame with a bunch of monks. Their comments about the referees and the play of the game would have made people like Chris Runkle and Dave Umberger and Jonathan Withington very proud for the language they could offer. How do we hold together, if not every day, but even for an hour, this wonderful balance and tension of the need to spend time with God alone and to find rest in God, and just to find rest, period, and the demands of the world that come at us? And for us. I feel for the disciples. Did you hear? Maybe you heard the way I read it. At the end of this long day, they've been to a Bible study. They've been to multiple Bible studies. Perhaps they volunteered all week at hypothermia prevention. At the end of this, the people are still there, and they say, Jesus, would you send them away? Let them go find food wherever they can. Just get rid of them. And Jesus responds to them, you go find them food. I was thinking of that this week, driving around with this gospel in the back of my mind or at the front of my mind. Three different occasions this past week, I passed someone standing on an island in the middle of an intersection with a sign. 
asking for food or assistance. You've seen some of them at the corner of Rolling Road and Old Keene. One just the other day here, just not too far from the church, Old Keene and Burke Lake Road. I drive by, and even with these words from the gospel on my mind, I think, God, would you just let me get home without thinking one more time about people who are in need. It's a challenge to find this life with God that's a balance between rest in God and prayer and trying to respond to the needs of the world that are all around us. So this past week, seeing someone on one of these islands, I happened to think about Some very good words and a great suggestion from a wonderful priest and friend I know in Baton Rouge. If you look up his, if you look up in the dictionary priest, you should see the picture of Ralph Howe in the margin. Years ago, I remember this suggestion, which I have forgotten until just this week. And so I share this with you. Ralph had a practice. Born out of conflict, do I give them cash, not knowing what they're going to do with it? Am I really going to take them to have dinner at the house tonight? All of this conflict. And so Ralph came up with, for him, was a simple idea, and it's one I share with you. Ralph would carry in his car a gallon Ziploc bag with beef jerky, water, lip balm, because you and I would go buy lip balm for ourselves, so couldn't we give it to someone else? Wet wipes, gum, mints, perhaps the things that you and I might like to receive as a surprise, as a gift. And Ralph made it a practice to carry one of these in his car so that when he did encounter someone on the road, he wouldn't have to go through the mental gymnastics of, do I give them money? I don't have any cash on me. Instead, he would simply drive by and hand them this. I'm going to keep one in my car so that when I pass folks in our neighborhood, I will have something to hand out. I can't solve world hunger. I can't solve hunger in Fairfax. What I can do when someone is in need is simply offer this. And if they decline and say no, remember the words of Jesus. Shake the dust off your sandals and go on. This is one small thing I can offer. The other thing I'm going to include in this packet is a prayer. Because I have to include a prayer, right, as a priest? I have to put something religious in there, right? In thinking about the words I could leave for someone who is homeless, aimless, someone in the middle of an intersection looking for what direction do I go, I thought of this prayer that many of you know quite well. And it's a prayer not specifically written for people who are homeless. Because this prayer was written by a monk. 
And so it might apply to all of us, no matter where you are this morning. These words from a well-known monk named Thomas Merton. Let us pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen.